The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous supporters. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash donate. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode number 78. I'm a doctor. I've lived for over 2,000 years. I am Scottish. I can complain about things. Shush. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. Today we're discussing the first Doctor story, the William Hartnell, in The Keys of Marinus. Joining me today on the panel are Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Hey, Dom. So, The Keys of Marinus. Uh, we're continuing our march through the first Doctor's stories, as we have. Uh, we've skipped one, uh, Marco Polo, uh, because it doesn't exist. Uh, in on his, video. On video. Uh, the audio is out there. But uh, and some this fan, you said fan animation? Uh, I'm not sure if, there's, if there are fan animations of this one. There probably are. You can definitely get the audio. And I've heard the audio from Marco Polo. And I wish, and there are some production stills, which look gorgeous. Um, I wish it still existed on video. And I really hope they make uh, an animation of it because it's, a, it's really a good story. Mm. Um, and it also explains why Ian is wearing such an unusual <laughs> silken costume in, in the Keys of Marinus because he's, he's wearing like these silk pajama type costume th that he was given uh, in Mongolia in uh, Marco Polo. That was going to be so, my my first question: Is why is he, yeah. Ian wearing this costume? Uh, and I just uh, looked on YouTube, and there is a site called Who Recons that has created this in what looks to be fairly primitive CGI, but mm -hmm. it's at least been something's been recreated. Oh, cool! Yeah. So that's cool. Marco Polo. Uh, so we've skipped that one for now, and then we're, we're, right now we're doing uh, the Keys of Marinus, which is a six episode uh, serial. That by Terry Nation. By T Terry mm -hmm. Nation, who's usually writes the Dalek episodes. I mean, he's the creator right. of the Daleks. Uh, but he's doing this one. Uh, no Daleks in this one. Um, and uh, aired in April and May of 1964. It's the first season for the first Doctor. So we still have Susan, Ian, and Barbara uh, continuing their journey. They still haven't gotten back to London, uh, con uh, contemporary London, 1964, where they started. Um, and... They land on this planet, Marinus, on an island of glass surrounded by a sea of acid. Which uh, is cool. It's very yep. cool. Uh, they encounter uh, this figure, Arbiton, who tasks them with the quest to... The classic quest story. You know, yeah. The, you, yes. you have Go must, find these MacGuffins. Yes. The four yep. of the five operating keys to a machine called the Conscience of Marinus. And he is the keeper of the Conscience of Marinus. Uh, and they have to travel to these five different locations, or I mean, four different locations to find the keys while avoiding the evil uh, Vord who are trying to seize them for their own purposes. And I was... I was really surprised by this episode. This is one of the, the first Doctor episodes I've never seen before. This is the first time I've seen this. My my uh, watching of early Who is kind of weak. Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> weak. I haven't watched a lot of these episodes. Of course, some of these episodes are ones that have been recovered in, say, the last 10, 15, 20 years. I don't know if this, uh, this serial in particular, but a lot of these early first Doctor episodes that do exist have been recovered relatively recently. Um, so I was surprised by this episode, first of all, by how elaborate it was. Yes. Yeah. This serial is probably one of the most elaborate of the early Who series I've ever seen. I think they shot half their uh, set building budget just on this serial. Um, but also how dark it was. Yes. Yeah, yeah. really. It, it's clear they haven't yet, in a, in a number of respects, they haven't yet developed the formula that will tend to govern the series going on. I, I really like the keys of Marinus as a serial. It's um, it in it. The series is kind of stretching its sci-fi wings. It's mm -hmm. because it, unlike, I mean, we had 
we had a lot of this actually in the Daleks, in the original Dalek story. It was a fairly ambitious story in terms of the sets and the environments that we went to. All of this, this new planet, Marinus, which is now the second planet the series has ever visited after mm -hmm. Skaro. Um, but it doesn't just all take place in near proximity. Um, we get a multi-environment story where we have <clears throat> the island surrounded by the Sea of Acid. We have another city environment that at first looks like it's kind of Greco-Roman, but then it turns out it's it's really kind of a slum. We have mm -hmm. a jungle set. We have an Arctic set. We have a city set. And so we get a bunch of different environments uh, that we kind of go through in a in a connected MacGuffin hunt that has been compared to a much later season right. of the show. I was going to mention that. Yeah. In the fourth Doctor's time, the key to time, where they had to retrieve the individual pieces of the key to time. Also, one uh, thing to note about this, there were those um, movies, theatrical movies that were made in the 60s uh, about Doctor Who starring Peter Cushing. And they were both based on popular Dalek stories, and they considered making a movie out of the Keys of Marinus, uh, but that didn't end up happening. Mm, interesting. So uh, so you, I thought that was a, that, that was a very interesting – it was an interesting idea that they, they decided to break this story up into basically five different locations – um, and, and, in, and in a large chunk of this, the doctor isn't present at all, uh, on the yeah, oh, jungle set yeah. and, and in the Two Arctic set. Yeah. yeah. That there, that, that's something they're pioneering because back then Dr. Who was in production and airing like 40 to 50 episodes a year. Mm -hmm. So, um, they needed to find ways to give the cast a break. And, and the way they did that was by having someone disappear for a couple of episodes. And that's the first time they've done this. William Hartnell at this point had been working for almost a year. And so he got a couple of weeks vacation and they, by having him jump ahead to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to two slots in finding the keys of Marinus so that he, so the actor could take a break. And in fact, you can see a decided difference in the doctor, from the beginning of this story to the end, uh, his his energy levels and his uh, even yeah, his ability. So. I mean, er, in the first couple of episodes, especially uh, he's um, or the fir the first episode, especially he's um, more tired. Yeah, he stumbles, he flum flubs a bunch of lines, uh, mm -hmm. and and in this, but later on uh, in the in the last couple, much more on, much more. Uh, uh, energetic. So it's very, very interesting to see the differences. Um, and, and there's actually, he, he when he does come back, there's actually a line um, where he says, improve rather than prove. And fans <laughs> have thought that's a blown line, but no, it was actually written that way in the script and he delivered it correctly. Yeah. That, <laughs> it's a very, I, I, I saw that. I wasn't sure why that would have been written that way in the script. I think they were trying to simulate the natu the fact that we naturally do make speech errors, um, but they could normally just count on William Hartnell to do that natively. <laughs> they didn't need to write it into the script. You right? know, that might have flat out been a typo by Terry Nation that no one caught until they were actually filming. <laughs> yeah. So the episodes, I love the title of each of these episodes, too. You have The Sea of Death. Uh, the oh, velvet the web, acid. yeah, the mm -hmm. the velvet web, the screaming jungle, uh, the snows the snow of terror, and the sentence of death. Yeah, <laughs> I just love that. Uh, it's very classic uh, TV serial sort of names, uh, over the top. Um, so they land. The, you know, we have this uh, the TARDIS. We have miniatures, miniature models, which is uh, I think new at this mm -hmm. point. Uh, yes, where we, this, this has the first miniature model TARDIS landing. And so we see the TARDIS uh, materialize without the TARDIS sound that we've come, become used to, right? Yeah, both yeah. landing and takeoff, they didn't have the sound. Was this – now you have to remind, remind me because we've been jumping back and forth so much. Did, did they have the TARDIS sound at this point? Yes, yes. But only from it the was, inside of the control room? Both in and out. 
Okay. Yeah. So this may just be a production error that the sound designers forgot to include it or something. Okay. That, things like things like that happen. There's a later episode in the uh, third Doctor where the TARDIS rematerializes and instead of fading into existence, it just pops into existence. And the reason for that is the Doctor hadn't had access to the TARDIS for so long that the special effects guys had forgotten how they brought it in. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> It's so funny to see like how laid back people were back then for this sort of thing compared to the way things would be done today. Like, no, well, like today, no one would ever let that go. Well, and it, the difference too is, you know, the, the production schedules were so much tighter. Again, you know, they're doing, you know, almost every week for a year and they've got to crank these out. It's almost like, um, you know, daytime soap dramas where when they film, they just got to keep go, 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 go and just let the flubs. Right, run. right. Oh, a while back, I was rewatching uh, some episodes of Dark Shadows, which was a soap opera. It was a gothic soap opera that I actually watched when I was oh. a little kid because it had vampires and stuff in it. Um, <laughs> and I was fascinated. Uh, like early Doctor Who, you know, they have kind of a cliffhanger in each episode and then they have a recap scene at the beginning of the next mm -hmm. episode to show you that cliffhanger and then how they get out of it. And on Dark Shadows, they would they were on such a tight production schedule, they would refilm the cliffhanger scene. And you mm -hmm. could see the differences because the sure. actors would say lines subtly differently or move slightly differently. You could see this is not the same scene as we saw right. last time. <laughs> There's one, one spot I saw, a, a definite production flub, where I can't remember which companion it was, but, you know, rotated through the wall and you can like, see behind the set and the production guys you know the crew standing there as the <laughs> wall opened yeah yeah the, the but, one of the void when they got sucked into the the oh, big pyramid yeah. by the way speaking of the companions i had a note that uh, i just really think one of the nice things about about this series and about this era of doctor who is the companions Ian and Barbara and Susan are just genuinely nice people. Yeah. You know, right. I watch them on screen and it's like, I would like to hang out with these people. William Hartnell, I like him as Doctor Who, would not as personable. Right. But Ian <laughs> and Barbara and Susan are just genuinely friendly people. Right. Although yeah. Susan can get a little annoying at times. She, she can. Yeah. They, they really do play up her, uh, the, the childishness of her, even though she's supposed to be about, what, 15 or 16. Teenage, uh, yeah. Yeah, they kind of overplay it. They really play her all younger than, than that. Um, At least she's not Katie Kaboom. Katie Kaboom, which is that from? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a segment on the Animaniacs about a teenage girl who <sighs> literally becomes a monster when she has mood swings. I forgot uh, about that. Mm -hmm. I have uh, I I missed Animaniacs as a... Oh, as a, you need you to go, go watch back. it. You gotta go back. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So, so, of course, the funny part is Carol Ann Ford at this time, I believe she was mid 20s. Yeah. Right. Well, that's a, a but that's a problem. The problem that happens is you're you they often get actors who are older than the age of the character. But the but the actor forgets what they were like at that age, that the, the exactly. difference isn't as as great as they they end up playing it. Um, I, one of the things that that apparently is true of Companions of the Doctor right from the beginning is there is the fact is they don't tell the doctor when things that he should know like for example <laughs> when he sends susan back to the tardis to get uh shoes for ian um she does what every companion does she sees footprints in the sand where there shouldn't be any and instead of going to tell her grandfather she follows the footprints don't don't <laughs> wander funny off we, funny, <laughs> funny we talked about rose doing that in the last yeah. episode, we're talking about Idiot's Lantern. Yes. Yeah. A, a very early pattern is established uh, with <laughs> the companions. Uh, and so, and of course, she ends up getting, you know, captured. Um, and so we have these creatures, the, the Vord, who you are... Look, look like guys in diving suits with, with exactly. funny, funny helmets. And they so were kind of... They were kind of meant to be the kind of the new hot thing after the Daleks, but they didn't end up being so hot. Although there is some spinoff media. There are a couple of big finish plays that have the Vord in them. 
So they once again raided the BBC cost, <coughs> excuse me, costuming department and found a bunch of wetsuits and said, these will work. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Let's well, make funny helmets for them. So are the Vord supposed to be humans inside these costumes? Yeah, they may be aliens, but they look like they're supposed to look like humans inside those costumes. Like Arbiton looks like a, like a human. Right. OK, because because what happens is, is they they use these vehicles to to uh, cross the sea of acid. Uh, these little submersibles and one of the submersibles springs a leak and the acid gets inside and and basically dissolves a vord in his vord. In, in leaves a suit behind um yeah so the suit is not their body but it's just they're wear it i can't imagine wearing a wetsuit including the flippers while trying to run around this 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 uh giant pyramid <laughs> it just seems inefficient maybe change yeah, out yeah. of that guys yeah, it does. In this episode, now they change this a little bit in some of the spinoff media, but in this, it's implied that the Vord are just a faction of the other people from Marinus that mm-hmm. are, that found a way around the conscience of Marinus. Well, and in fact, their immunity to the conscience of Marinus could be related to the the costumes they wear. Well, and it's it's um it's kind of implied that they're that the Vord look like other humans because the companions are asked you know are you bored you could it's be bored. right yeah. i can't remember exactly when but there's some point where they mention that so yeah so let's talk about the conscience of marinus it's a, this is a very uh, interesting concept this is a very mm-hmm. uh, at the center of this story uh it's sort a giant plastic dodecahedron right that uh, acts as a an external imposed conscience um mm-hmm. it was a judge and jury that was never wrong but it, yeah, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> but but it was then made more and more powerful, so that eventually it took over as the conscience of every person on the planet. So no one could ever choose bad. No one could ever make an a, an evil choice or a wrong choice. They don't have to have the burden of free will. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> they eliminated evil from the minds of men for seven centuries. Arbaton says, but then the Vord developed an immunity, or some somehow were able to avoid. The influence yeah. of the machine, and they turned off the machine and hid the keys, so that the Vord couldn't use the machine to control everyone and make um, them evil. Right, right, uh, and because the machine takes away free will. I mean, hey, what what an idea! Well, yeah, well, I like now, the idea though that they took the one key and they they put it on top, like you might put your key on top of your you know above your door. So <laughs> yeah, they left one key right yeah. yet, just on top of the machine. I find it just I find the way the conscience of Marinus is handled in this just fascinating because it's so different than everything else that happens later in the series. I mean, it, we've noted how at the beginning and even the show has noted Peter Capaldi's doctor noted at the beginning, he wasn't really a hero. He was just traveling. And wow, is that on display here? Mm-hmm. Because in every future incarnation of Doctor Who, Free will has a huge priority. And to imagine the doctor not really having a problem. I mean, he does at the end say he values free will more than than uh, what the conscience does. Right. But he's not passionate about it at all. He's kind of like doesn't really have well, a problem. And, I if, mean, and the, the only reason why they did this whole adventure wasn't to help them. It was just so they could get back into the ship. Yeah. And he's like, doesn't have a problem with, OK, we'll help you rebuild your mind control device as long as we can get back into the TARDIS. And it's not just the doctor. And I think this is kind of where the macguffin aspect of the plot shows. A MacGuffin is something that motivates the characters, but not really the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and and even the characters in this are kind of blasé about whether they get the conscience functioning again or not. Mm-hmm. Right, they're just they need they need the keys because they, they had to, they they create had to create this Terry Nation in writing this had to create a situation in which the Doctor didn't d- didn't have access to the TARDIS, so Arbiton mm-hmm. puts a, a shield around it, force um, shield, yeah, a force shield, uh, and and give them a reason to cooperate with Arbiton uh, in his quest to, re- to retrieve these keys, and so yeah. like you said, the the Doctor's motivation is well, got to get back in the TARDIS. Um, I guess we'll help you enslave the the planet of Marinus again <laughs> through this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and but even the Marinans, like um um, are uh, his daughter 
Sabitha. You know, and Sabitha yep. and her, the other guy too, the other young guy, Altos. love interest. Altos. I mean, they, they're they kind of blasé about it. The the people they meet are kind of blasé. Everyone is kind of blasé, <clears throat> which is interesting. I found it remarkable that um, Arbitan himself has admits to the doctor that he's lost all of his followers and his emissaries haven't returned. And I'm going, why would you help this loser? <laughs> he, he's already admitted his project has fallen apart and he can't attract followers. Obviously, there's not a lot of support for this viewpoint on this planet. <laughs> and and then if he's locked you out of the TARDIS, but he lets you back into his pyramid castle, why don't you just twist his arm until he shuts the force field off? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you, you do outnumber him at this mo at, the, at this point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't they just sit there with their little time rotors and keep clicking until they got back? Yeah. And he's already turned <laughs> off the force field and run for it. Right. <laughs> right. Right. So they're they're travel dials. That's the way that they solve this problem of the uh, no access to the TARDIS. So how do we get everywhere and get to all these different locations on this planet? Is the, they have these transporters. Uh, that they call Which travel dials. I, I thought they looked like Dick Tracy wristwatches. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of just... they're kind of like the time ring that uh, the Doctor is given in Genesis of the Daleks. You wear it on your wrist, and it'll take you places. Only these are limited to taking you to places in space that are pre-programmed, rather than places in time. Right, and we see versions of this even in New Who, where River Song has one, uh, the uh, Captain Jack has one. Uh, so it's it's uh, yeah. It's, the it's, later ones are time enabled, but these right. are just to move you around, Marinus. Right. So ba so trans transportation, instant transportation, is a feature of the universe, uh, not just the TARDIS. Uh, so uh, they so that's I mean really the 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 Sea of Death, the first episode, is setting this all up. It's not a whole lot that happens, but it sort of sets the stage to send. Uh, the doctor and companions out and um, the, the doctor and Susan and Ian um, and Barbara all leave at the same time. And they, they're well, going to Barbara the leaves, Barbara leaves a few seconds earlier, right. which then apparently becomes a few hours earlier by the second episode, because she's, her situation has changed so much. She clearly didn't land there a few seconds before the rest of them. This is a, a an issue I was going to bring up, which is that, um, the 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 transportation sort of has like it's sort of in it's inconsistent. Um, mm -hmm. you know they they leave generally at the same time, and then someone arrives hours or days even. I I mean I got the sense that maybe she got there a, a, several days early, but the the way she's already change clothes she's so familiar with everything um she's met with the leader of the play yeah yeah i mean it's just this whole strange like it like how like and they don't and they don't seem to think it's strange they're sort of like oh you know yeah. it's expected um yeah i think we're meant to employ the mst3k mantra at this point it's really just it's just a show i should really just relax <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> i think of that as the uh, the william shatner mantra but uh, similar uh, <laughs> idea. uh it's, so she gets there and um they, they they arrive after her. They walk to this door, and they were in this, like you'd said, uh, Jimmy, this uh, Greco-Roman paradise. Um, and Barbara is in this uh, flowing well, don't, robe. Don't and, forget, I mean, they, they they walk in. There's this alarm with the annoying siren yeah. and lights. And, right, right. Uh, very bright light, uh, which we later learn is probably whatever the the the, 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 the mind control them. Ones. Right, the yeah. mind control that uh, is changing their perception. So what what might later in Doctor Who have been called. Called, oh, it's a perception filter, right? Yep. Essentially, they they don't call it that, but it's essentially how this works. Um, and uh, they they encounter these sort of uh, these people, including Altos and Sabitha, who they all are seemingly very bland, lacking personality, mind control, drone ish folk um, who want but to not to not to the point that they're creepy. Right, right. Uh, just sort of bland people uh, I'd yeah. say, who are willing to 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 cater to every single whim and need perfectly to the to the nth degree, um, the, the, including a laboratory for the doctor. He, he, he wishes for a, a laboratory. 
with every conceivable scientific instrument. I'm going, dude, you've got the TARDIS. That is a laboratory with every conceivable scientific instrument. (laughs) Right. Um, He he later kind of explains, he says he's hoping to find a way to fix the time circuit on the TARDIS. So he needs technology from off the TARDIS. But initially just the, oh, I'm a scientist. I must want a lab. You know, (laughs) it is kind of implausible the way they set it up. Right. Right. Uh, uh, Susan uh, predictably wants a beautiful dress and and so on and so forth. And then uh, they they take a nap. Uh, they, it's it's bedtime uh, and they all lay down and go to sleep. And while they're sleeping, Sabitha comes out and places stones on their foreheads. And as I'm watching this, I'm thinking this wouldn't work on me. I I am a yeah. I'm a, a roller yeah. and uh, I don't sleep. side sleeper. Exactly. Yeah. Defeat uh, their evil plans. Yeah, sure and, enough. And sure enough, that's what happens. Yep. <laughs> Barbara rolls over in her sleep and the stone falls off. Uh, and when they wake the next morning, uh, you know, Ian and Susan and the doctor are having this sumptuous breakfast, drinking this amazing orange juice and uh, uh, crystal goblets. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Barbara wakes up and she's like, <laughs> Barbara's reactions in this are just hysterical. She's like, she's shocked to the point of rudeness. <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, she's like, get those rags away from me to, uh, to referring to uh, Susan's uh, lovely dress. And, you know, the she throws the the goblet, which she sees as a disgusting mug. It, yeah. And yeah. I love the I love the reveal of the mug because the doctor's yeah. just been talking to Susan and we've seen the crystal goblets it's they're drinking beautiful. out of. Yeah. They're going how beautiful they are. And then um when the doctor tells Susan to get uh, get Barbara some fruit juice, Ian is in the foreground and the do- and the doctor and Susan are in the background. So you can't see Susan's hands as she's pouring the fruit juice, but you just see her doing something behind Ian's back. And then she reaches around with this perfectly ordinary coffee mug. <laughs> and it's a it's it's an effective reveal. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's uh, it's it's filthy, she says. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah there's the, the, uh, the but earlier on, the doctor and uh, and Ian are like, look at these exquisite glasses, Chesterton. Uh, oh, can I have more orange juice, please? So you, they're really playing it up. It's so funny. Oh, yeah. And then Barbara wakes and uh, they, she's like, uh, no, it's filthy. And the doctor admonishes her. Now you've broken it. Uh, it's one of a set. <laughs> you've destroyed <Yeah>. one. <laughs> like, wow, it sounds like my mom. Uh, exactly. And then I, I uh, guess I guess you can chalk it up. Now, really, I think they're just interested in world building. And this is where the MacGuffin-y aspect of the plot kind of shows through in weak writing. But if you think about it, they're on this. They really want to get back on the TARDIS. They've agreed to go get these keys. They need their travel bracelets to do that. So when Barbara shows up, she loses her travel bracelet and doesn't go looking for it. And they have to bring it to her as, Oh, Hey, my travel bracelet. Thanks. Right. And then none of them spend any time initially looking for the key. That's the reason they're there. None of them says, Hey, do you know anything that looks like this? Have you ever seen one of these before? We're looking for something like this. They do no investigation about the key. They're just interacting with their new Greco Roman environment. Well, now the only thing I could ex- I could say as a way to kind of try to, to try to maybe explain that is that when they got zapped with the mind control yeah. device, it helped with that. Right. You know, it, it kept them, it kept them focused more on the stuff right. that they were yeah. getting from them then instead of the image, instead of the, what they were there for in the first place. Right. And so we can kind of headcanon that eventually we learned that the, um, the, the city that they're in is, I mean, we see from Barbara perspective, it's all a dump. Yeah. And I, and I love when the doctor and Ian are being shown the lab and we never actually get to see the lab, but the doctor's like holding up a piece of junk and going, Oh yeah. With, with scientific equipment like this, I bet yeah. I can fix it's, the TARDIS. It's like an empty room. <laughs> I mean, it was, you know, what we did see of it was an empty room with a table and a mug, another mug. So. Yeah. <laughs> with chips, the, the, the uh, enameling chipped. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we, but and, we, it, we okay. learned that behind all of this yeah. are these creatures that live in glass cases that are basically brains with eye stalks. Yes. Um, I was waiting for them to start the, betting quatloos on everyone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, although this precedes the quatloos, yes. uh, the gamesters of Triskelion. Um, apparently in the script, there's a little more information about these creatures. They're called Morpho, and the city they're in is called Morphoton. Right. Um, and I think... 
somewhere, I think in the script, it says that they outgrew their bodies, their brains does, outgrew their it bodies. It does say that. They do say yeah. that. In which case, their bodies must have been really small if these brains busted out of them. <laughs> yeah. um, but oh, the, the most amazing thing, though, is so like Ian is totally under their power and they order Ian to kill Barbara. Right. And he proceeds to do so yeah. or try to yes. do so with no sign of struggle at all. We don't get one of the classic cliché, oh, I'm torn. I love this person and now I'm being commanded to kill him. None of that. Ian is just totally their willy drone. Right. And and meanwhile, Barbara encounters Sabitha, who uh, was the girl who placed the stones, who's under the control of uh, Morpho. Um who is turns out to be Arbitan's daughter, who he'd sent to go get the keys, and she's wearing one of the keys on a chain around her neck, and and um, Barbara is able to eventually get her to respond and to snap out of it. Now, one of the things is um, Morpho is like, oh, we, in four hours we'll give them the final treatment, and they will be irredeemably under our control. Except, except they weren't. Ex- well, except Sabitha and all those were able to break their break free from their control. So. Uh, but right. maybe that's because the Morpho, they, they, did they, did they kill? I forget what, did they kill the brains in a jar? Yeah. Ian yes. breaks the glass. Yeah. Well, Barbara starts smashing Barbara, the glass Barbara, and that's yes. what stops Ian. Right. Yep. Right. That's what it was. Um, if you have brains under glass, they must stay under glass. Otherwise it's a bad thing. Um, <laughs> Why so, did you use pexiglass is another story, but yes. Yeah. Um, so it actually makes some sense. I mean, <clears throat> if your brain was exposed, you wouldn't you would want it in a sterile environment if your yeah. brain had busted out of your body. Well, this is true. This is true. Uh and so uh you know, now that everyone is free, they bur- they're burning the city and they need to uh uh escape from this. And uh Oh, and that makes no sense because if I am a newly freed slave from mind control, my first thought is not going to be Let's destroy the only material assets I have by burning down the city where I live and that and my house that it contains. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so this is at the point where the doctor gets the brilliant idea of he's going to skip ahead to the end, to the to the last location, while uh, Ian and Barbara and Susan continue on to the next two locations. He's going to try to find Altos's friend Eprin. Uh, in the city that we're going to come to. Uh, but they're going to, you know, take the long way around, so to speak. Um, Get the other two keys. Yeah. And Susan is like, she's sad because she's going to not going to see her gra- the grandfather and decides to leave without, you know, really a long goodbye and disappears. And uh, and bar- leaving Barbara and Ian to, to, to catch up. And s- then she appears in this jungle, which is screaming and mm-hmm. overwhelms her. And that takes us to the next episode, The Screaming Jungle. Um, now, uh, I'm trying to remember so, exactly what happens with well, Susan in this, here. Uh, Susan is initially overwhelmed, but then the jungle stops screaming. And so when Ian and Barbara show up, they kind of start exploring their environment. Right. Um, they find this kind of stone jungle temple thing and um, that's kind of booby-trapped. And Barbara gets tra- stuck in it, and then Ian tries to get in. And it turns out there's this guy who is another one of of uh, Arbitan's former associates who is here manning the temple and keeping the, keeping the key hidden. He actually um, has two keys, one of which is a fake. Right. And they realize that's a fake. And he eventually decides he can trust them, but he's apparently dying for no obvious reason. And yeah. uh, he gives them this message, DE302, and uh, points to a doorway. And and this is all as the jungle is preparing to become active again and start screaming. And then it's going to come to life and attack everybody. So Vine's... And that happens. So vines start to try to probe their way into the temple and strangle people and stuff like that. While Ian and Barbara are trying to figure out what DE302 means, their first thought is that it's a safe combination and there is a safe there. And they try it, but it doesn't open the safe. <clears throat> so then as they're looking around and as the jungle is attacking them in the temple, 
um, they notice that there are all of these beakers filled with chemicals that have chemical formulas on them. And they decide DE302 is a chemical formula. So like the O2 is it's like an oxide. And um, it, this doesn't really quite work because there are no chemical elements on the periodic table that are known by either D or E. Um, and the TARDIS should be translating that for us into whatever uh, this would be. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just a show. We should really just relax. And so in the Hooniverse, there are elements D and E as well as oxygen, and they find a beaker labeled DE302. And lo and behold, it does contain the key they're looking for. It's kind of funny. Just doing a quick search here for DE302, I found someone decided to answer that in fan fiction. Of course, fan fiction, they go all over the place. Uh -huh. But but in this fan fiction, they decided DE302 was the, the metal that the Time Lords used to build TARDISes. Oh, well, oh, there you okay. go. Yeah, well, it's convenient. So yeah. that's one explanation. I mean, again, it's fan fiction. So, yeah. I mean, there's there's fan fiction about everything and some things that are not safe for children shall we say but so yeah, it's, that was kind of cool it it's a uh, tritardus oxide <laughs> exactly <laughs> so uh i got i don't have a lot of notes about this particular uh episode of the serial but uh, a couple it, of things it's really adventure yeah there's a couple mm -hmm. things that that stood out for me one is uh this conversation with barbara and susan they talk about how Ian treats them like fragile China, but once in a while they like to rebel a little bit, which is kind of a funny little moment. It yeah. maybe it speaks of the the time of it that it's yeah. from uh, this and, idea. And, and, and Susan actually says she likes the way that Ian protects them. Yeah, and so there's there's kind of they have ambivalent feelings about this. Right, right. So there's that moment there, which is kind of a, a funny moment. It sort of it sort of sets the tone for the the, the time frame that that this is uh, this show was created at that point. Um, it's also it's also a human moment. We can appreciate things that people do, but they can those exact same things can also yeah. sometimes get on our nerves. Exactly. Right. right. Um, I also, uh, you know, uh, another note, which is, you know, Susan, she recognized the screaming, but didn't know where fr from where she'd heard it. And, and I don't know that they ever paid that off. I, did, do you, I don't remember it getting paid off. Did they pay that off? I don't, I don't think so. So kind of odd that that was an odd throwaway line. Um, you could write some fan fiction about that. I think I will yeah. about uh, <laughs> the time Susan encountered a living for, uh, force. I'll call it Day of the Triffids, which is my other <laughs> note. Uh, this was, there was actual an accusation of uh, of uh, copyright infringement or plagiarism, put it that way, that uh, the, the, an accusation that uh, the Terry Nation plagiarized Day of the Triffids, which was a story about plants that that come alive. Attack. Yeah, the deck, uh, and as that, and there was actually had to be an extensive. Uh, um, See, Robert Gould, who wrote, I think, wrote Day of the Triffids, um, complained to the script editor that, I think it's to the script editor, that he had submitted a uh, an outline about this to, to somebody, and that he claimed that they then stole this and gave it to Terry Nation, who turned it into this story. I don't know. Uh, they showed that was not the case. Yeah. It was an and interesting it, little episode, it, but... Yeah, it also I think it's kind of overplaying one's hand because you no one person is going to have a monopoly on attacking plants. Not right. when there are things like Venus flytraps in the world. Well, and it's sort of the I mean again the the nature of science fiction is, is that there's only so many truly original ideas that you can come up with. Uh Yeah. And and this is early sort of early science fiction and I think that we're, they were still feeling this out um uh, on this sort of idea. Um, kind of a, a production production note I got a kick out of um the when they would climb on the 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 idol that would then spin around <laughs> how was an actual crew member's hands that closed in on them it yeah. wasn't like some set piece it was an actual person back there yeah you could, them. you could sometimes see the fingers moving uh, independently um <laughs> the, uh, well another thing is nobody ever believes poor Susan. Like Susan, like it, these things happen to her, and everyone's sort of like, "Oh, you're just a a, 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 a oversensitive you're little girl." Yeah, you're hysterical. <laughs> it's and poor Susan. Um, 
But one of the, the, the traps is uh, a Barbara has this uh, net land on her and then a spike trap is descending from above and she's about to be impaled and she's, oh, save me, save me. And I'm thinking if only she had a travel instantaneous travel device strapped to her yeah. wrist, she could survive. <laughs> like, hello. <laughs> uh, that's just a, a little a little thing. Well, there. I like I like how Darius was standing there watching it, too. Yeah, yeah. here it comes. This is my favorite part says Darius yeah. <laughs> watching them get impaled uh, very strange so they they get the uh, and, and we never mentioned the reason that the, the forest the jungle is alive is because Darius was conducting these experiments uh, that with time with, and evolution right and they and the, the, tree, the plants had evolved too quickly um, another one of these be careful of science sort of uh, mm-hmm. stories um, and that brings us to the fourth episode. They 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 escape from there and head off the, to the snows of terror. The they came to Montana this last winter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, an icy wasteland, as it's described. Uh, that actually <laughs> that sounds familiar to me Montana too. Montana this last winter. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have. I, uh, I, go ahead. I like how I like how when they blink into this new Arctic environment. All of a sudden, Ian and Barbara are incredibly tired and pass out in the snow just (laughs) because they've been so strung out by their adventure in the screaming jungle that they showed no signs of tiredness in. Now they're now they're completely overwhelmed by exhaustion. Well, don't, don't you know if you go out when it's when it's that bitter cold, you've got like ten seconds to get where it's warm, or you're just going to pass out? Yeah, that's not how hypothermia cold. works. <laughs> well, but they ex- they don't explain it as hypothermia; they explain it as being tired. Yeah. Oh, do they? Okay. Yeah. They say I'm so tired, and they you know. Yeah. But it, it, I I guess I got it was the idea of you know you're that natural reaction of being, you know, you get tired and so you just pass out. Right. right. And and uh, we should say that uh, Sabitha, Altos, and Susan had already left for this location uh, ahead right. of Ian and uh, Barbara, and so that they were already here. Uh, so uh, Ian and Barbara are discovered by this trapper, um, Vassor. Vassor. Um, and at one point, uh, like he's rubbing Barbara's hand and he's saying, do you fear me? And I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> like he is yeah. so he's creepy. A, um, he's also telling her most men do. And it's like, well, then I probably should, too. Yeah. And, and, and that's actually introduces an element in this uh, sort of a, um, this is a family viewing hour sort of show. Yeah. Like this is a tea this time is show. Mo- yeah, this is the most amazing thing. Once Ian has gone in search of Susan and Altos and, and uh, Sabitha, Vassar is left alone in in the cabin with Barbara, and he tries to rape her. Yeah. yeah. And, and now, I think the way they got away with this, and it's just mind-blowing when I first saw this, um, that's like, wow, I never dreamed I would see an attempted rape on Doctor Who. Um, especially in night in a nineteen say, you know sixty well, especially in classic who at least you yeah know, yeah knew who you might see something like that but yeah but this I mean this was tea time family viewing and I think the reason they were able to get away with it is because like in I I thought about how I would have processed this as a kid and as a kid I wouldn't have understood there was a that this was a rape attempt because they never mentioned sex. Yeah. Um he's just like saying I'm not going to wait any longer and kind of grabbing her and chasing her around and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um and I would have processed that based on all the cartoons I'd seen as a kid where like you have one character trying to kiss another yeah. character right. and force kisses on someone, which was, you know, played for comedy in Looney Tunes and stuff. Now, today oh, yeah. people would say, oh, sexual harassment. Um, well, OK, yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's how I would have processed it as a kid is this is like that. Exactly. Yeah. There are some truly creepy lines from Vassar here. He says, uh, oh, now we're alone. I must get you some food and fatten you up. <laughs> Which is I love the look on her face too, like really. <laughs> yeah. But then he says that door will keep anything out or in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, you're smooth, Vassar. Real smooth. Yeah. You've been up on the there's mountain. A reason a why he's, there's a reason why he's a trapper living on his own on the mountain. <laughs> I was gonna yeah. say he's been up on the mountain a little too long. I think um, he, he he does do one thing which is clever, which is when he sent Altos off. Um, 
to, to in search of Sabitha and, and Barbara, he gave him a pack that was full of meat so yeah. that the wolves would smell it and uh, <laughs> yeah. and yeah. and and come 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 attack him. The old uh, raw meat in the bag trick. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then and then I, I love how they deal with that. They uh, that once once Ian realizes that's what's attracting the wolves, he just chucks the pack away so the wolves will go after the <laughs> <Yeah>. pack. <laughs> <laughs> well. I love too that the, the wolves were obviously like uh, reused from like a documentary, a yeah, nature yeah. documentary, stock yes, footage, documentary footage. <laughs> and now, meanwhile, Susan and, and uh, Sabitha were abandoned in this uh, uh, cave mm-hmm. by Vassar because he had found them first, uh, mm-hmm. and they're slowly uh, going cold up there until uh, Ian and Barbara and uh, Altos find them there, uh, and that's where they're going to search for the key, um, and uh, as they. Is they're, they're, they kind of go deeper and deeper into this cave system. That's where they, they end up meeting up uh, over this um, this chasm. Crevasse. Yeah, this, mm-hmm. yeah, this crevasse, which is a, a, a rope ladder. And then um, they, 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 they don't pay attention, and Vassar's on one side and they're on the other, and he drops the, the bridge. Ha-ha! I've got you now! You couldn't possibly leap five feet across this... Ch- this chasm exactly. <laughs> to come back and get me, uh, but uh, so they do. <laughs> but you know, they keep going deeper, and uh, they come to this room. And this is—I kind of think this is a little clever little setup. The key—it's—it's uh, it's just almost like a video, like a video game. You know what I mean? Uh, like oh, you have to get past I the th- boss, and the key is hidden in a puzzle. I thought it was like Dungeons and Dragons. This felt very much to me like Same a Dungeons kind of and Dragons adventure. Right, yeah. exactly. Oh yeah, very much so. Uh, let's in fact this is kind of a funny like uh, I I've heard this hack before like um if you need to hide something in your house, hide it in a block of ice in your freezer. Yes. Uh, cuz no one will mm-hmm. ever look there. Um so like, the, key, the key is hidden in a Like if you want emergency cash, you put it like in a little con- waterproof container and then freeze it. Right, exactly. Mm. Um, uh, the, so the the key is is frozen in this giant block of ice with these pipes around it, which is clever, and which uh, are connected to a volcanic spring, so it'll thaw the ice if you turn the valve. Right, this valve, which is it's, it's uh, <laughs> see, uh, this was a kind of a funny moment. Uh, they find the key. Uh, Barbara says, "Ian, over here, it's some kind of valve or something." Not or something. It's literally a valve. It's a valve. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just a valve like a or valve something. That everybody has in their house to turn on and off their water main. I mean, exactly. or their garden hose. Yes, it's, it's a valve or something. Or yeah, it's a, it's a Barbara. It's a valve. Uh, but then there are these four like uh, frozen knights, soldier knights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They look like knights, and it's with the armor and the helmet and stuff. Uh, which, stationed or stationed around the frozen key block of ice to right. defend it. And, and none of our, our heroes uh, seem to think twice about these four knights that are standing there. Like, uh, what? I wonder what they're here for. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, very much, a, 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 I felt like an Indiana Jones vibe. They chose poorly in this instance. My, my thought was, we are the knights who say me. <laughs> <laughs> you must open the block of ice with a herring. Uh, so, <laughs> so they they melt the uh, ice, which melts these characters who start coming after them with the swords, and uh, Ian cleverly yeah. collapses now, the, uh, the 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 wall or whatever the entrance to temporarily block temporarily, them. Yeah. yeah. Now, by the way, speaking of the walls, I, I love the set design. Mm-hmm. It's it. They've got this hard plastic. Clear yeah. hard plastic, right, to over the walls to make it look like it's ice. But in some places, it's just plastic wrap. <laughs> and at one point, Barbara has a line of, "I didn't realize these walls aren't rock; they're solid ice covered in plastic wrap." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and but then when they thaw out the guards, so they they by the way they have two tasks here: they need to get the key back, and then they also need to get back across the chasm. Right now that um now that uh, Vassar has thrown down the bridge from his side, they can't reattach the the bridge uh, ropes to the other side. So Barbara says, maybe we can find some planks or something. <laughs> And put it across, and and they don't actually do that. Instead, they break off big icicles. No, they're and, logs. And they they said they were logs. No. Uh, that's well, that's what I saw what, in it. What I what I saw was icicles. That, no, I thought that they looked they, like they were icicles that they had lashed together and kind of froze. Because yeah, because they're very they're very um, thick on one end and thin on the other. Right. And so, it, and I thought that was a creative solution. If you're in an ice cave. 
break off icicles and crawl across those. So they then have Susan go across with a rope from the bridge so they can reestablish the bridge. Okay. Me, the, the transcript I was reading, it, the, uh, it had it, uh, the, the, the set direction on it as logs, but Ian's line is, is that maybe they'll freeze together. They're cold on the hands. Yeah. We don't want them to break. That sounds like ice. You're right. Yeah. Um, they then uh, have, you know, f- uh, melted the ice block to get the key and the guards have come to life and are attacking them. And it's fascinating. The guards don't ask if Arbiton sent these people. I right. mean, they were here to guard something that Arbiton had hidden here and was presumably going to retrieve it some date. And you would think they would ask, did Arbitan <laughs> send you? And if they don't ask, you would think the people retrieving the key would say, it's OK, Arbiton sent us. But nobody does any of that, and right. we have this battle chase sequence all the way back to uh, to Vassar's cabin, where he gets impaled through the door by one of their swords and dies because, of course, he has to, being such a jerk. Right, he's the bad guy. Um, by the way, I love the almost Wilhelm scream when the one guy falls into the <laughs> yeah. car, into the into the crevasse. Yes, um, there was a uh, Ian. Okay. So at the end of this, um, they, they're in the cavern, ca- cabin, cabin, uh, with, Va- like you said, with Vassar and he gets impaled and cause and Vassar's like, see, you're stuck with me now. I've got you now. And they're like, nope. And they, they have the travel dials and they, they pop out, uh, of there. Ah, and here's another inconsistency in the travel mechanism because they all pop out together. But in the next episode, sentence of death, Ian has popped in before everybody else does. Yes, and well, long enough before for the action to happen, which is uh, he's appears in so, some sort of vault. There's a dead guy on the floor, and Ian ignores the dead guy. Well, <laughs> oh, he checks look, him out first. Yeah, and yeah. Then oh, yeah. Into, oh, there's the key. Oh, but the key. I'll go get the key. And and while he's trying for the key, somebody bashes him in the head with a mace, and uh, then puts the mace in his hand. Um. To frame him. <laughs> to frame, and I, as I was thinking, this is like, if he belted the other guy over the head, how do you end up on the floor? And where'd the key go? That was my question. Now, I have to say, props to the to the script. They don't ignore this. This is actually the the whole well, pardon the pun, key to this to this episode, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is how did Ian get belted over the head? What's what, like? What is the theory of the crime? Uh, and they come up with one that's semi plausible, at least of how Ian ended up this way. So their new environment is a city called Millennius, which suggests a thousand years. And um, it's a seemingly somewhat technological advanced city, but it's also overrun with Nazi knockoffs. Um, You have these guys who are so Millennius kind of calls to mind the thousand year Reich right. that Hitler wanted to establish. And all of these guys are dressed in in what look a lot like Nazi uniforms, like black SS uniforms. Right. And um, and you have this guy named Taran who's in, a, in an, an investigator that is like Mr. Nazi interrogation stereotype. <laughs> but he's a, in the Guardian division, they call it. Yeah, and we're told the laws in this country are a mockery. So by our characters, well, you're, so you're guilty until proven innocent, right? Yeah, so it's very much trying to call, and and at this point, you're going. So maybe the conscience of Marinus would have a few redeeming qualities, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or or that's evidence of a system that that does not place a lot of stock in free will. Um, yeah, oh, and, true, and freedom. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it sort of it flows from that. Uh, and and so, um, so he, they put Ian on trial for right. uh, murdering this guy, and he's presumed innocent. And the doctor becomes his lawyer to get him off. <clears throat> and and uh, so we have an investigation get started to try to figure out what really happened. I like how the judges in this investigation have these absurd headdresses. Yes, <laughs> and and what that's inspired by for Americans who wouldn't may not be aware is in England, judges will still wear these elaborate sheepskin wigs. And so judges have elaborate headdresses in England. And here we have an alien. They're not made out of sheepskin, but we have this alien version of a judge's ceremonial headdress. Right. 
Right. You and, know, and, one thought I had about this this whole trial um, scene, which I thought they, they did a, a really good job with it again, you know, for the for only having 25 minutes um, in the uh, Star Trek D Space Nine, they kind of play with this idea where the Cardassian justice system is if you are you are found guilty before you even have a trial. And the purpose of the trial is more to show how good the trial system is, the justice system is on Cardassia. <laughs> right. And you go there not to defend yourself, but to plead that you were wrong to defy the Cardassian government and that you should have a lighter sentence because you are sorry for what you did. It's right. very much a similar mindset. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the system is what's important. Uh, the individual is not. Uh, and that's that seems to be here. I feel like the um, the the conspiracy was somewhat complex, but well done. I mean, I feel mm-hmm. like that that was well written, um, that was believable. Uh, the the various players in this conspiracy were were good. Um, mm-hmm. So what we have is, is the relief guard. The, the so there was a guard inside the vault, and then there would be a relief guard outside the vault. Uh, to come in case the guard inside the vault needed him. And so uh, the relief guard was in on it, obviously, the, the inside man. And his wife, ter- it turns out, was also in on it, along with the prosecutor. Not, and we don't know any of that at first. Right. We get this revealed little bit little by little bit. Um, Susan and Barbara go to confront uh, the relief guard, and he he kept us like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they they kind of keep trapping him into into like revealing like so the you know we we actually have found the key. You can't possibly have found the key. I hit it too well. I mean, he does yeah, that. Yeah. He does that like twice. <laughs> does that twice. Yeah, this guy's not the brightest bulb on the tree here. He's not, but they, I think they could have found a better uh, accomplice uh, in this. Yeah, and by the way, this episode, just like we've commented about some kind of jaw dropping moral things earlier in this story, you know, the doctor not caring about free will, Vassar trying to rape Barbara. <clears throat> we get a couple of more startling things in this episode. Aiden hits his wife. Right. So off we have screen. Actual yeah. off screen, but we have yeah. actual spousal battery here. Yeah, you just which they off. Yeah. They didn't even do in uh, in the Idiot's Lantern, where we had a guy who was engaged in at least emotional spouse abuse. But in New Who, they they didn't they pulled back from the physicality. Here they don't. Right. We hear the sound of the slap, um, and then later in court, he gets killed by a ray beam assassination in front of his wife. Right. Well, which in fact, is also we, kind of startling. In fact, would, are we led to believe that she's the one who did it? That she's she shot him. Uh, maybe I didn't get that, but maybe I, I wasn't. The, the action kind of happened pretty quick, and mm-hmm. at the end, where the where everything's explained, uh, the the mandatory uh, explanation of of the conspiracy, uh, I thought that it, it was leading us to believe that she's the one who did it. Um, mm. If so, she got hers. I guess. <laughs> yes, she mm-hmm. did. Um, and so the doctor all along knows where the key is. He's he's figured it out, but he doesn't tell anybody because he knows that if he says, he, you know, if he if he reveals, oh, well, the key was here all the time, um, then it means th- th- it doesn't get it doesn't prove that Ian is innocent. It just in- implicates the doctor. Um, he's mm-hmm. got to get the, the the actual conspiracy conspiracists to, to confess to or confess give themselves away. Right. Right. And, and he wants to use that knowledge. Uh, to, for to, for his benefit, because you know the Taron, the investigator, you know says they've they've scanned the the uh, room using psychometric scanning techniques. Yeah, uh, and they they checked the mace that was used to kill the original guard and determined it was not previously held by Ian. Right. So that gets Ian off the hook, and he says they did a psychometric examination of it, and I was really surprised to to for them to use that phrase because that's a so psychometry in the real world is a proposed psychic ability to detect information about an object by handling it the idea is a psychically sensitive person can hold an object and figure out things about the owner of the object and so that's uh, something that you know, they weren't called New Agers then, but that's something that's kind of been part of New Age psychic lore since 1854. I looked it up when was that term coined. Um, 
So I find it interesting that they're pulling in that concept from psychic phenomena and using it here and saying, we did a psychic examination of this thing I, and determined Ian was not the previous guy who held it. And I'm just glad that psychic powers work so much better on Marinus than they do here, because our court should never listen to testimony exactly. like that. Exactly. So, um, and, and by the know, way, it does say in the 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 last episode, you know, the the this the scene on uh, Millennius was actually over two episodes right. uh, that that Kayla did kill it. She had the gun hidden, and she okay. was the one that killed him. Okay, okay, her so- husband. Oh, I, I I got that right. And so the key, it, it turns out, was hidden inside the mace for a very good reason, which is as the murder weapon, it would be removed from the the crime scene. And therefore, when they're searching the crime scene for where the key was hidden, it would be wouldn't there. Find it. And a, they didn't yeah. scan it. They had some kind of, of like X-ray type scanner that yeah. everything had to go through before you came in and out. But it never was because it was it was the murder weapon. Crime. Yeah. Yeah. So if I ever have to hide something at a murder scene, I'm putting it in the murder weapon. Just so you know. Um, but don't tell anyone. Don't give it away, dude. <laughs> yeah. no, Spoilers. No. As, a, as a criminal, I'm supposed to give it away. That's how I get caught. Don't you know that? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I wrote in my notes that this was the Law and Order episode of Doctor Who. Uh, so he, it was very, very much. It felt like a little bit uh, like a Law and Order. Um, yeah. So. Uh, Aiden, of course, um, uh, Ian, of course, is um, uh, not guilty and they have all the keys and return to. Yeah. By, by the way, before we leave Marinus, a couple yep. of notes. Um, I like the microphone. Uh, I like the telephones. Oh, yeah. That they mm-hmm. have in Marinus. It's basically a rod that looks kind of like a microphone, but it has different grains of the holes on one end versus the other. So, you know, yep. which end to put up to your ear right. and which end to put up to your mouth. But I thought it was an effective bit of prop design. But it could also be used as a, uh, a speaker phone. As well. Yeah. Yeah. So I like that. I also found it amazing that the court does not care about the fate of the micro keys. Right. You know, we're taking them back to power this mind control device. It's going to take over <laughs> all of you guys and make your judge jobs redundant. And the court doesn't really care. Yeah. That's true. That's true. I didn't I didn't think of that. That's a good point. And and that was also another interesting point is the fact that you mentioned that this final location of, at Millennius, the story of Ian's trial, they did split it up over two episodes, unlike the previous ones. Um, and so we have a cliffhanger ending. Um, and- yeah, Susan, they're going to kill me. Thunk. Yes. <laughs> yeah and then uh and then we we but once the trial's over they return to the uh the island island of glass and the sea of acid which we we were told that these were constructed that the sea of acid is not a naturally occurring phenomenon on this planet which is good it's like a defense mode right mm-hmm. uh because otherwise this would be a very a, a planet very poorly suited for human life uh if that was sort of the natural environment um so they return to this uh, to the island, and Arbatan has been killed in their absence. Wait, has he been killed in his in their absence? Yeah, yeah, he, he was like he, in the first he, episode. He got like right after they left. Oh, right, yeah, right. One That's, of the board got him. Uh, so much happened in this, like I, I kind of lost track. Uh, and and so the Vord are now in control, and Yartek, who's the leader of the Vord, uh, is wearing Arbatan's robe with uh, the hood up and. He's got this. He's got this giant head thing going on, but nobody seems to notice that Arbiton <laughs> yeah. suddenly has this giant head uh, under this hood. Uh, but you oh, know. But, never seen way, Catholic monks walk around with that. Oh wait, this <laughs> hood don't stack up that high. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Yartek, we're told, is the original founder of the Vord. He, it was him who figured out a way to resist the conscience. Right, and and in the end, uh, you know the. This is the typical running around. It's not. I mean, they they some people get locked up and then they have to get released from the cell. And uh, and in the end, the doctor ends up destroying um, the. Actually, it was it was, it Ian. was Ian. Ian oh, does it. They they right. shove it's, all of the keys into the conscience to reactivate it. But because they got that false key in the screaming ju- jungle, right. Ian substitutes that for one of the real keys. And so when they shove in the false key it causes the conscience to short itself out. And and so we, we it's it's kind of, this is this if at anything is where we kind of get 
the them saying, you know, hey, it's probably just as well that we don't have a a, a device that enslaves people. Uh, yeah, in, in I, their I, I wrote. I, I wrote down the line, the doctor is talking to Sabitha and saying machines can't make laws. Machines can make laws, which is kind of startling in of itself. Yeah, right. But he says machines can make laws, but they cannot make justice. And so he just delivers that as kind of his final summary. But he doesn't he doesn't seem particularly passionate about it. Right. And Sabitha, as the son of the guy who was the main ideologue behind the conscience uh at least in recent times also doesn't seem per- she seems okay with that too right nobody seems to have particularly strong feelings about they're, they're uh, kind of like yeah it's just like yeah we'll just go back to millennia it was a nice place to live so, yeah. at which point i'm wondering like a nice place to live well so why did you just destroy the darn machine in the first place like right. if nobody kind of cares maybe they should have just destroyed it and the, so the board couldn't have used it but yeah yeah, yeah. So so I think it's kind of I think the idea of the conscience is interesting. I think that Terry Nation doesn't integrate it into the psychology of the characters and their motives well enough. It comes off as too MacGuffin-y. Right. But despite that fact, I still really enjoy the overall story of the Keys of Marinus. I think it's yeah. a fun adventure. I like that we go to all these different places and there's like a different mystery and set of rules in each place. And I think it's an effective story. Yeah. I mean, it's... it. it it's it's an arc, a story arc, <laughs> which is yeah. some sort of an early version of it. Um, and when and as we end, we don't get uh, the a preview of the next episode. That's one thing that they've been doing. Yeah. I don't know about Marco Polo, but in other uh, serials, they've been kind of previewing the next adventure. But we don't get that here. I'd have to check. This might have been at the end of one of of their first renewal block or something. And they may not have known if they were going to get picked up for further episodes when this was written. Okay, okay. So, yeah. I, was, I, it looks like, um, yeah, it was – it aired at the end of May, and that, that seems like it could possibly have been a a, a uh, transition point. Yeah. It also could be that it just the story is complex enough. They were running long and didn't have time to insert – didn't have running time to insert – um, a, a preview of the next episode. Right, right. So uh, anything else you want to say about uh, the Keys of Marinus uh, besides what we've already discussed? Uh, it's, a, a, like you said, it's a fun story. So, you know, listener, tell us what you think. If you know, if you get a chance to watch it, it's available on BritBox uh, for sure, and, and there's, uh, I'm sure, other places as well. Uh, give it a watch. Let us know what you think. And... Uh, and uh, you know, do you have the same impressions as as we do of this? Um, so give us some feedback. Visit us at sqpn.com or our Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page and leave us a comment there, uh, or send us an email to Doctor Who at sqpn.com. Uh, you can find links to all our personal uh, social media and websites on our show notes on sqpn.com. And uh, we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing. Uh, the Tenth Doctor again as we jump back and forth uh, between the, the classic and the new. This time we're going to be doing the Tenth Doctor two-part story, Impossible Planet and the Satan Pit, which is such a great that that actually that name fits in with the Keys of Marinus names, the Velvet Web, yeah. the Sea of Death, the Satan Pit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Even the Impossible Planet. Yes. Yeah. So until then, uh, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who pleasure Dom uh, Father Corey Stika thank you as well glad to be here uh, once again I'm Dom Bettinelli thank you for listening and remember who is he he's a doctor when will I see you again uh, soon I expect or later one of those